So welcome everybody. My name's Catherine. Um, I work with the spiritual program team and we're absolutely delighted to welcome Venerable Yunten to um, this session today and all of you in person and online to this session today. Um, this is our early incursion into trying to rebuild some in-person community as well as um, keep it all open to the online world. So it's um, lovely to be able to actually build some more Sangha community at this time. It's a very important element of, of Buddhism is, is that spirit of community. So thank you for showing up in person and thank you for showing up online. Um, Venerable Yun Ten um, recently arrived here at Land of Medicine Buddha. Um, she's American born, but she's been teaching um, in New Zealand, Australia. She still teaches um, uh, psychotherapy meets Buddhism training. Um, regularly in Israel. She's very international and we're very lucky to have her here as um, one of our newest um, residential teachers. She's going to be spending six months of the year at Land of Medicine Buddha. So we're really feeling very fortunate to have her here and very happy to have you here too for this intro to meditation, to Buddhist meditation. Thank you, Venerable. So welcome everybody. This is just going to be an introduction or an experience of Buddhist specific meditation. So I'm sure that everyone here has done some sort of meditation, maybe for many, many years, maybe is very experienced. Um, we're gonna do a particularly Tibetan Buddhist style. We'll touch a little bit on the different types so that you can get a, a sense of them. And maybe you will want to weave them into your daily practice or maybe not, but then you'll have some context. So in Tibetan Buddhist meditation, we divide things into analytical meditation, single pointed meditation and visualization or mantra meditations. And they're kind of tidy delineations intellectually, but experientially there's some chapters within one session where you might be meditating analytically for a while on something like compassion and you're really thinking about the logic of compassion your experience of compassion the disadvantages of when compassion is not present for example really using your analytical mind intentionally within a structure but then you might touch it and really feel compassion and from that place you might abide one pointedly and just stay with it and then inevitably you'll get distracted again and you know, start thinking about lunch or something. And then you bring back an analysis to invigorate it once again. So even though it might be technically an analytical meditation, you might take points within the session where you rest or abide single pointedly. In single pointed meditation, you have one object for lack of a better word. Um, it's not a physical object, but it's a meditation focus. It might be the breath, it might be a mentally generated image, it might be a concept, and it might be the mind itself. And any number of these can be single pointed meditation objects. And as in all meditations, whatever you choose for that session, you have to stick to. So if you're meditating on the breath and then suddenly think, I shall meditate on the moon. <laughs> that is an obstacle because you're kind of indulging your mind's habit of chasing yeah, or hunting or craving. If you're meditating analytically on compassion and you have a brilliant thought about patience, patience is good too, but not right then, right? You think, okay, those are brilliant ideas. I will return to them. Right now I'm staying within this framework. And this is how it's different than just having a think or reflecting. Yeah, you're really doing something very intentional and structured. And the reason for that is that it has more likelihood and more efficiency to move from your head to your heart. You're also connecting with things that you've already understood and agreed with intellectually, but might not practice as regularly as you want to. So something like compassion, again, is something we all value and want to have and do have to one degree or another, but maybe not as consistently as we would like to. Why is there the disconnect between how we would like to be and how we actually are? Familiarity, yeah, repetition. So coming back to what you already understand, what you already value and agree with, 
reinforces and deepens it so it's more likely to come out in your daily life. Things like visualization and that might fall under the heading of Buddhist Tantra, which is different to other Tantras, but is related. Buddhist Tantra is going to use your senses for you rather than against you. So you're using your visualization abilities. You're using sound, color, shape. You're using all sorts of sensorial things which are normally distracting and organizing them into the path to enlightenment. So it's a multitasking type of meditation and requires a lot of focus and a lot of grounding in the basic philosophical tenets of Buddhism. But it can be really wonderful for Westerners who are already used to multitasking. So we might be able to visualize something while we recite something, while we're thinking about the references of it, holding those all together. So these are kind of the basic types of Buddhist meditation. And then there's branches upon branches and variations of a theme within those. From a Mahayana Buddhist perspective, the goal is very important. The goal is enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And this can be hard for us as Westerners because we are perfectionists. Yeah, because we want to be good. And I think that when you're aiming for something like perfection, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure and you can feel like you're a terrible person when you don't achieve it. And that is not the intention of thinking of the goal. The intention is to lift you, to inspire you, and to remind you that you are not your suffering and you are not your ignorance. These are all removable things and that enlightenment is a state that is available to all of us with practice, which is free from suffering, free from ignorance, and more importantly, is actively altruistic, actively seeking to benefit others just naturally. And so we have to work our way into it gradually, and it's gonna take a lot of thought and preparation, but in terms of meditation, we always want to launch our meditation with a very clear motivation. Why am I doing this? And your reason why might be, I like peace of mind. I want to be relaxed. I would like to be more patient today, <laughs> right? But what we want to do is to say, those are side effects. Those are not the goal. If the goal is enlightenment, you will have more peace of mind today. You will be more calm. You will be more patient. But if you're aiming only for that, the energy of that ends. If you're aiming for enlightenment, then you're kind of gathering momentum. And you can continue with that same trajectory off the cushion as well as on and kind of continue it the next time you come to the cushion as well. So the reason why is very important. It doesn't have to be a Buddhist reason why, but for your meditation to be powerful, it's very important, I think, to ask yourself, what was my first reason for sitting down? And what's a way to expand it into something that is more than today, more than myself? So you're acknowledging your basic reasons why, which might have just been, I'm struggling or I'm curious, but you're then consciously saying, and so too are all sentient beings. May this have a positive ripple effect. Does it make sense? So we'll go ahead and do a meditation, um, but do you wanna ask any questions before we jump in? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much, so clearly. Um, what is enlightenment for the Western model? As opposed to the Eastern model or as opposed to yeah, for the modern householder, what is enlightenment? Like if I say I wish to, my first reason in sitting down is to become enlightenment. What does that mean? Enlightenment? Yeah, the, the question is what is enlightenment mean? <laughs> and it, it's a really important question because it's going to mean something different in different contexts. And enlightenment from a Buddhist perspective means all negative states of mind have been overcome all positive states of mind have been developed. So that means no longer suffering, but also no longer unkind or unwise. It means not just loving kindness for your family when you're in a good mood, but loving kindness for all sentient beings equanimously, regardless of whether they help or harm. 
So aspiring to that can be a little overwhelming or we can lie to ourselves and say, yeah, yeah, I believe that, therefore I do that, you know, and skip all the steps in between thinking that's a wonderful way to be. I would like to be that, therefore I am that just because I like it and kind of, you know, become a little fake or a little inauthentic, a little plastic and it can get creepy, right? We've, I'm sure all met people in spiritual communities who are a little too good, yeah? And it's hard to kind of um, reach their heart because they flick off all stress by saying, it's all good, it's all good. And you say, is it? Is it all good? <laughs> you know? And you appreciate so much their good heart wanting to frame things that way. But in your own mind, you know, there are some things that are not good, yeah? War is not so good. For example, famine is not so good. So we can't just flick it off and say it's all good. That's a shortcut. It's uh, maybe spiritual bypassing or spiritual laziness to say so. So aspiring to enlightenment, what we're really asking ourselves is what is the human potential? What is the potential of our mind? Is change possible? Can I suffer less? Can I harm less? Can I be happier? Can I be kinder? And already your life has proven you can. And you can backslide and you can get worse. Many things are possible within the mind. It will do whatever it's trained to do, whether you're intentionally training it or incidentally training it just through your habits. Right? So what we want to do is consciously ask, what are the habits we want to keep and maintain and grow? And what are the ones that maybe are out of date? Mm -hmm. They made sense at the time, we're not bad for having had them, but their time has come. Yeah, like that. So enlightenment is like that, removing negative states of mind, suffering and ignorance, developing positive states of mind, kindness, wisdom. Yeah, to their utmost extent. Yeah, go ahead. So um, thank you also. Um, so can you give some examples of intention because I've always said an intention for peace. So when you said that, I was like, <laughs> yeah. And now you're saying that's rather a, an effect of the, the path to whatever your intention or goal is. So can you give us an example or a couple of examples? Because I'm kind of more of a concept person. Sure. And so peace for me was, was, a, was a really nice intention. But you're saying that's actually a byproduct. <laughs> Um, she's asking what's an example of a good intention and the one that she always used was peace and now she's wondering if that is in alignment with Buddhist intentions because it sounds like I'm saying that's not good enough. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> right. And, and I would ask, you know, what's your definition of peace, for example, because it might be that that's perfect and you can keep it. Um, what I was kind of cautioning us against is something like I'm meditating because I want to be relaxed right now. That's human. That's natural, that's fine, but it can be bigger than that and more than that and still achieve that, you know? And if you're thinking, I want peace, is that peace just for yourself? Is that peace just for your community? Or is that peace in general, a ripple effect, world peace, sustainable peace? And it might've started with, I just would like to not be stressed, thanks. <laughs> and that's fine. But if you're consciously expanding it, having first acknowledged it was limited to begin with, but now I'm going to say, and for all living beings, it's going to just have a better long-term effect. It's going to have more momentum. It's going to have more depth. Yeah, so you can keep peace, but just an upgraded version of peace. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So when I was reading some of the verses and some of the other things, it's oftentimes something is said to the effect of and how this will affect all sentient beings that you may or may not know. So I don't know, could you just expand on? What, what does it mean to have an intention for all sentient beings if most of them you don't know them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, sure, the ones I meet, but you know, a lot of other ones. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And, you know, in Buddhism, there's a grand um, emphasis on the fact of interdependence. 
Yeah, so the fact that all living beings are connected to one another, have an impact on one another, is a, just a baseline philosophical concept that we keep coming back to again and again. So the ones that we don't know impact us, we impact them in some sort of direct or indirect way. And we could even think most of our life is from indirect benefit from sentient beings. The clothes we wear, you know, like, do we know who made them? Maybe, <laughs> you know, like the food that we eat, do we know all of the sources it came from? The roads that we use, the car that we have, all of these things are from the kindness of others. Whether it was intentional kindness or incidental, we're benefiting from it regardless of their intention. Everything we use is pretty much from strangers and a small amount is from those in our immediate life. So if you're thinking, so too my impact, like what are all of my choices doing for the greater good or doing to kind of neglect the greater good? And just kind of being conscious about my choices are not small little incidental meaningless things. They actually do have a ripple effect. And if I've been making choices that are caring about others, that creates a very powerful, important habit in my mind, which is good for me and my relationships, but it also brings out the best in other people, you know? So, I mean, you can take the simplest example, like you're at the grocery store in line, bunch of stressed people in line at the grocery store, right? Happened a million times. Have you been there when someone in the line kind of breaks the fourth wall and like starts to talk, you know, like, oh my gosh, you know, and are like, hey, are those on sale? Or I love your scarf, I don't know. Or your kid is cute. Or, you know, someone cracks the like fragile social facade of let's pretend we don't see each other, like awkwardness that we do. And like, then the whole line relaxes. Yeah, and, and then other people start talking to each other. And it's like friendly and nice and you get to the parking lot and you're not so stressed and you might actually look in your rear view mirror and not drive into someone, et cetera, right? It has a ripple effect, just one person choosing the greater good in that moment. And it's such a simple thing and you may never remember their name. We forget that we have an impact on people constantly, whether we're aware of it or not. You know, our atmosphere that we bring into a room has an impact on the whole room. If someone came into this room full of rage, but was silent, we would still feel it, wouldn't we? It would just kind of like radiate. So it, we forget that we're having that impact on people all the time. If we're in a good space, it invites a good space from the people next to us. They may or may not take that invitation, but it helps. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just having that mentality and don't, don't ever diminish your own radius of impact because we all have one. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, yesterday, I was so lucky to sit in a conversation about what is sentient beings and, and who is sentient and who is not sentient on earth. And I really contemplated that overnight and thought to myself, how grateful I am to eat and how, well, how if the redwoods join roots together underground, would they, are they sentient versus this beautiful lettuce that I'm eating with the gorgeous tomatoes? How can that not be? Is that sentient? Like who prays for the plant kingdom? <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, what's the difference between sentient life and non-sentient life? Yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important question and it's a debatable question. For, first of all, it's one of those things where there may not be agreement and that's totally fine. But from a Buddhist perspective, we say anything with consciousness is sentient life. So then what is consciousness? Does it rely on the brain? Maybe, but we would say the mind and the brain are not the same thing, mm -hmm. definitely not from a Buddhist perspective, take that or leave that. So then what about plants? Are they sentient or not? Um, certainly they support sentience. Certainly they have sentient beings on them. Whether they themselves are sentient is something we would say, maybe not, but they're still valuable and important. But there might be a good argument for them being sentient because do they have intention? You know, the intention that you were describing of, you know, connecting roots together and things like that one proof of sentience might be intention. 
you know, so something that doesn't have a brain, but does have a nervous system, you know, like a mollusk or, you know, something like that, that like, they have plans, you know, <laughs> a mollusk might have plans, um, but there's no brain there. Are they sentient? We would say probably, probably. And at the end of the day, everything that has sentience or supports sentient life is important. And we want to be kind and careful and not take it for granted. So kind of like if the jury's still out about a couple of things, like some plant life, is it sentient or not? Regardless, we want to take care of it. Regardless, it's important. Um, if that makes sense. So just a follow up then, when I use prayers of may all sentient beings present or around be free from suffering, should I tail in that, including all the plants that give us the oxygen and keep it, it certainly wouldn't help to add all the plants. It's not gonna. It's not gonna hurt, right? <laughs> like, it's not gonna hurt. Um, one of our prayers would say, "All sentient beings and environments." Yeah, all sentient beings and environments. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions before we do a little sit? Yeah, sure. So, really, uh, when you do a meta meditation, meta being loving kindness. Yes. Uh, the beneficiary is also you. So I think we need to stress on that, right? When, I mean, true, they are giving it to all the sentient beings, but also it's coming back to you. It, she's asking about like how a meta meditation isn't just beneficial to sentient beings, it's beneficial to you as the individual meditating. And that is 100% true. And we don't want to neglect the self. But a lot of Buddhism is about putting this self in the correct perspective and the correct proportion. So when we say all sentient beings, we are never leaving out this sentient being, right? We're including ourselves in all sentient beings, but in the correct proportion, because there is a, an unfortunate thing that happens to us where we think in order to be happy, we need to spend a lot of time thinking about our happiness. Right? It's kind of counterintuitive to think, actually, I might be happier if I spent less time thinking of my happiness. What if I thought about the happiness of the greater good? I wind up being happy. Have you ever been the host of a party and you really want everyone to have a good time? And you weren't needy and you weren't neurotic. You just genuinely wanted people to have a good time. Can you picture a time when you've been a happy host as opposed to a neurotic host? Yeah. <laughs> and when you're in happy host mode, you're really looking like, is there enough food? Is there enough drink? Is the music the right volume? Are the people warm enough? And you're really thinking of them with such warmth. And at the end of a party like that, you, the host, are tired but happy right? You're really happy because you were thinking of them. And this is how meditation works, where you're in no way neglecting the self. You absolutely acknowledge it has a benefit to you. But from that place, then you just kind of move on to now let's think of others, not in a martyred way, not in a doormat way, not in a, you know, creepy way of like shame and guilt and all that mess, right? But just a clean, clear how wonderful it is to live in a way that is acknowledging interdependence. Yeah, so for sure metta helps you um, and acknowledging that is important. But when we talk about self-love and self-compassion in Buddhism, it's, it's a little bit more, how to say, not intellectual, but it's a little bit more logic-based and a little less kind of touchy-feely. So self-compassion means stop hurting yourself Right? So self-compassion means stop doing the behaviors and the thoughts that lead to your own suffering. It doesn't mean go to the spa. You can go to the spa, right? But it's going to have limited effect. Yeah. Self-love is, you know, may I have happiness. But from a Buddhist perspective, that means you have to understand the cause of happiness is constructive, beneficial attitudes and behaviors. Yeah, it's not chocolate. But you can have chocolate and chocolate can help be a catalyst for some happiness, but it's just a condition. It's not the substantial cause. If it were, you could have a million Toblerone blocks of chocolate and still be happy at the end of them. And you would be sick and you'd be tired and you'd think I'm never eating chocolate again. So if the chocolate was the happiness, it would always work. You know, 
but it can be a condition and that's fine and don't beat yourself up have your chocolate but you know so this is how we talk about it in buddhism where self-love and self-compassion we have to be a lot more strategic and long-term and logical about what does it actually mean to relieve your own suffering and to build your own happiness and why what is it for Okay, so we'll do a little sit and we'll start with what's called a clarity of mind meditation, which is using the mind itself as the meditation object. And this can be a little bit abstract, which is why the common analogy of the sky and the clouds is given. And maybe a lot of you have done a version of this. The basic premise is that your mind in its natural state is calm and clear. It's the afflictions and negative states of mind or like the weather of the mind that distorts its clarity or makes it feel oppressive or oppressing. So if you can come back to the natural clarity of the mind, which is always there, you can kind of act from that place and feel from that place and life is better. So it's a kind of a sky not the clouds meditation, but it's harder than it sounds, but don't make it too intellectual. Just kind of like be with non-reactivity. The key thing here is spacious, not spacey. Okay, <laughs> relaxed, not vague. Yeah, focused without stress. Okay, so we'll start with the breath because a lot of us understand the breath and that can help the surface distractions settle. And then from the breath, I'll lead you through some instructions to try and abide in the nature of the mind. Okay, so start with a posture that feels stable, where you can sit up straight without it hurting. And if you need to adjust a little bit, the main thing is to see if your tailbone feels supported and that you can sit upright without a tension in your lower back. And if you'd like to have your hands in the Buddhist way, you can have left on the bottom, right on the top, two thumbs gently touching, or else just relaxed in your lap is fine or on your knees. And just breathe into your posture a couple of times, allowing the body to settle and feel grounded. And then we set our motivation. So thinking things to yourself like, whatever peace I find or touch, whatever insights I have, may this all be to work for the welfare of all sentient beings. May I grow my mind into its fullest potential in order to benefit all. And you can phrase that into your own words, but do so in a way that it actually touches your heart, something altruistic. And with the sound of the bell, shift your focus to the breath.
and just be with the breath. If it's a shallow breath, you simply know that it's a shallow breath. If it's a deep breath, you simply know that. Just be with knowing the breath. And if you notice your mind becoming distracted, just notice that and consciously bring your focus back to the breath on purpose. Give it your full interest. And now gradually allow your focus to leave the breath and see if you can go into watching your own thoughts without engagement. Watching your own thoughts like clouds in the sky, not agreeing with them or disagreeing with them, no push or pull, just watch. If you feel yourself fall into your train of thoughts, gently pull back into the observer mode. Some of your thoughts may have words. Some of them might be more images or sounds. 
Sometimes there's space or static. Try not to be concerned with the contents. Just watch. If it seems as though there's some spaciousness in between the thoughts, like space between clouds, allow your focus to lean into those spaces. Shift your attention more and more to that reflective clarity. Vast and bright. Awake without analysis. and try to maintain a focus that is neither too tight nor too loose. If your mind is feeling at all heavy, become aware of your posture, allow your eyes a bit open. If your mind is agitated, focus into the area behind your eyelids, dark, and quiet. 
And when you feel your focus back in balance, go back to the meditation object. Try and be with the mind itself. The thoughts will keep coming and going. Different sensory experiences might attract your attention, but they're not your main interest. See if you can settle into the nature of mind. And now consciously move from awareness of the mind back to awareness of the body. And just become aware of your physical experience, both what is comfortable and what is uncomfortable. Reground yourself with physical awareness, mentally scanning through the body. And think to yourself, through the energy of this focus, may I move towards my fullest enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And you can relax your attention. got a few minutes left if you have some thoughts or questions um, and I don't know what's going on with that music outside <laughs> but if it wasn't that it'd be a, a leaf blower or someone whistling or children playing or something right there is always something um, how did it go could you feel that there's simultaneous things happening in the mind where there there is a spaciousness and there is a movement yeah, there's movement of thoughts, emotions, whatever, but then there's also a spaciousness at the same time. And then, you know, you can kind of focus on one or focus on the other. Did you have a little bit of a sense of that? A great stillness. Yeah. And it's always there, you know, it's always, the sky is always there, even in the worst storm, you know, and I know it's cliche and I know we've all probably done versions of something like this, but it, it boils down to, you know, a key philosophical point in Buddhism, which is there are main minds and there are mental factors and main minds are more observational, less judging. And sometimes we need judgment. Sometimes we need analysis. But if we can kind of come back to the part that is less judgmental and is more spacious, it gives us a break and it gives us back our objectivity where we're not assuming all of our judgments to be true. We have the space back to choose. That's a good judgment. That's a bad judgment or that one needs more investigation. It gives us back our objectivity. 
And that also brings us back peace of mind. Yeah. Yeah, other, yeah, thoughts, go ahead. Um, you mentioned three opposites that were sweet. And one was spacious, not, uh, spacious, not spacey. And the third was focused without stress. What was the opposite of not vague? Relaxed. So she was asking about my pair of opposites that I was talking about <laughs> with um, when meditating, here's what not to do. So yeah, spacious, not spacey. Relaxed, not vague. Focused, not stressed. And, and I say that because normally when we're focused, we can be focused, right? We're focused in all sorts of areas. We're focused driving, right? But focus is often associated with stress. And just by the mere fact of focusing, our brain or, or our nervous system or any number of things says focus equals stress. And we have to remember there are two separate things that are just used to being friends, you know? But you can break that association. Focus can go with relaxation. Like when you're in a flow state, when you're really enjoying what you're focused on. Maybe it's yoga, maybe it's reading, maybe it's art. You know, you're very focused, but you're also relaxed, you know, when you hit that sweet spot. And that can happen in meditation too. And then to say, you know, spacious, it's like release your mind from all of the trappings that we normally are confining it in that says, I need to be stimulated in this way or entertained in this way or busy in this way. You know, all of this kind of like crowded, rumbling agitation allow yourself to kind of rise above it or go behind it or hold it differently. But that doesn't mean disassociate, <laughs> right? It doesn't mean like Elvis has left the building, you know? You're not going into your like fugue, you know, sort of like vagueness. That is not the invitation. But it's uh, common, you know, if we're feeling overwhelmed and everything is too much, sometimes we just leave, <laughs> yeah? And we're just kind of living a half-life for a few hours, kind of autopilot. And that is not the invitation in meditation, but it's what we're used to when we say, you know, try and get away from your agitated mind. We just kind of blank out, yeah. Or we fall into some form of entertainment to give ourselves a break. It's totally natural. It's very human, but it's not the ideal. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, go ahead. This is a little bit of a weird question, but like when, like we are like beginner novices, obviously, at this we're weekend meditators. I mean, I am, I'll speak for myself. And like, I'll, I'm taking this moment to be really conscious meditating. But like when you're at a level of a Buddhist monk, like is it the opposite where they're in meditation and then it's a conscious level to like come away from it and right. perform your life? Or right, right. She, she's asking about kind of like, what's the difference between being a beginning meditator or a more advanced meditator in terms of like how you shift gears? Yeah, like yeah, I'm thinking like during the, like we are now meditating and then we'll go back to our lives and do that. Like and for the monks living in a monastery, is it the opposite? Like they live in a meditation stance and then there's rare moments when they have to. You know, <laughs> <laughs> she, she's asking, is it, is it different for monks and, and nuns, um, you know, in terms of do we have to consciously leave our meditative state to interact with the world? And um, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> it depends on who you ask. <laughs> Um, you know, to be a monk or a nun does not mean you're a professional meditator necessarily. It means that you like it and you're pursuing it and it's a big part of your life. But um, monks and nuns can be any kind of thing, right? You can be a monk and a nun, monk or a nun, and also a nurse or a monk or a nun and also an artist or a teacher or work in prisons or be, do some sort of counseling or offer service in administration or, you know, there's a million things you can do as a monk or a nun. And a lot of us do spend a lot of time in retreat or in meditation for big chunks of our life or big chunks of the year. But the intention is that the going within is so that when we come out, we are more efficient, more present, more kind. So we always kind of go in with the intention of how will I be when I come out? You know, so it's not like a, an abrupt shifting of gears of now I have to force myself out of my cave. It's that I only went into my cave because I want to be of benefit to sentient beings. You know, so we all know, you know, if we're very stressed, we're probably less easily kind. 
when we're really relaxed, when we're happy, kindness just comes naturally. It's not so much work, like we don't have to decide, oh, be kind right now. When you're happy, you're kind. When you're relaxed, it's easier. So actually cultivating meditative states is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's not all blissful and dreamy. If someone says, oh, I was in retreat and I'm so relaxed, I'm so blissed out, we think, oh, what were you doing? <laughs> what were you doing in that retreat? But you know, you're looking at your stuff pretty baldly, pretty directly, and that's confronting for most people. So um, speaking from my own experience, when I meditate and then I come back out into, you know, kind of every everyday life, whatever that means, sometimes it's a relief because it's like uh, enough of my own mind, thanks. <laughs> Let's just chop some vegetables or, you know, <laughs> do something normal. It can be a great relief. So I guess, you know, the summary of all of this is what you do on the cushion and what you do off the cushion are supposed to have a relationship, you know? And so the cushion is like, your launch pad for the rest of the day or the rest of the life. It's like you're gathering your energy, you're reclaiming your priorities, you're touching back your good heart because we all have core values and ethics and a will to live an examined life. And then we get distracted. Yeah, we get distracted and we get stressed and we forget the things that we hold like most dear. And then we're like ashamed or guilt ridden. And that's not the point, but kind of coming back to yourself on purpose makes it much easier for your good heart to be accessed walking around for you not to lose your cool with the everyday stresses. So um, one of our teachers, Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo, very famously says, um, you should meditate, you know, 10 minutes every day, unless you're very stressed, then you should meditate 20, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and it's, it really is like that. Yeah, yeah other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is something um, that I learned a few years ago here, um, but I think especially for Jay and for some others who are newer, could you talk about definition of suffering because what when you're new to this idea the, the word suffering that sounds like something different than the buddhist definition of suffering right like we, we think of suffering oh my gosh they're starving or they're they're in a war zone when i i've learned it's, mm. it's a lot more about being anxious than, than all of those other she, she's asking what's the Buddhist definition of suffering? Because, you know, if you're talking in a worldly perspective, you might say, you know, I'm well fed and watered. I'm not suffering. You know, I get a headache now and then sometimes I fight with my kids, but, you know, I'm not suffering. Right? Right, exactly. But from a Buddhist perspective, it's we're saying everybody is suffering all the time. And you think, Am I the only one who's not? I feel fine. <laughs> yeah. Or, but, you know, or, you know, the other side of, you have no idea. Let me tell you about my suffering. <laughs> right? Let me tell you. So I think that, you know, from a Buddhist perspective, we talk about suffering in terms of like a spectrum. So that all of us have physical and mental suffering pretty much all the time, but that could just be minor unease or discomfort. You know, like even you're healthy and happy and doing yoga all the time. Is your body 100% comfortable? Like 100%? Or is there like something that's a little out, you know, or a little off or a little tight or a little something, even at your best? When your mind is happy, when you're enjoying the people in your life, when you're enjoying your work, when you're enjoying your alone time, you're just generally in a good space, not too depressed still isn't there an edge of discontent, even if it's only like a 5% edge of discontent that's saying, I am happy, but couldn't I be happier? Yeah, happier, isn't that something accessible to me? I thought it would be better than this. <laughs> yeah, I thought it would be more than this. Is that all there is? There, there is an edge of discontent. And that kind of suffering we all have, and Buddhists talking about it is a great relief because then you don't feel like you're the weird one who hasn't figured things out. You know, are all, isn't everybody else fine? Am I the only one who's never 100% content or 100% comfortable? And you realize, oh no, I'm not the only one who's not 100% comfortable or content. That is the state of existence, right? And what's more than that, there is also suffering of change, which is that even our happiness is doomed to failure. 
right? In the sense that it's changeable. You know, like it's wonderful to go for a swim in the ocean, but only if you're too hot and only if you're well rested. Then you're swimming for a while, you get too cold, yeah? And then you, you know, you get tired and then laying on the beach is a lovely relief. And isn't it nice to bask in the sun? Then you get too hot and you wanna go back in the sea and then back and forth and our whole life goes by, you know? And that most of our happiness is just relief of the previous suffering. It'll be nice to stand up because we've been sitting. It's nice to sit when you've been standing, you know? So we talk about suffering in layers and we talk about it in terms of spectrum. And we talk about the fact that our whole existence is suffering in the sense that we don't have total control. Yeah, we're under the control of karma and disturbing emotions, namely under the control of ignorance, which gives us this illusion of separateness. And all of that is just totally poignant and depressing unless you look at like the second noble truth, which is why, and the third and the fourth, which is here's out of it. You know, so why even talk about it unless there's a way out? But of course, from a Buddhist perspective, these are all removable. So suffering is anything that is not fully content, not fully comfortable, and is something we all have to one degree or another, but don't have to. Yeah. We can train ourselves out of it. And did that clarify it, or were you thinking about a different direction? I was, I was also kind of like emotional, being ang yep. anxiety, um, being frustrated, being... Yeah, anxious, things. anxiety, all those things, yeah. You know, any kind of negative feeling. Yeah. Somebody cut in front of me, you know, I'm... I'm yeah, like, yeah, I'm it's like, like it can be all tiny, of those but things, yeah. All of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Fair, like, may all living beings be free from suffering. Exactly. that needs to die. May all living beings be free from suffering sounds like may all sentient beings die to this person and it is understandable why you would think that. But from a Buddhist perspective, we would say that would not end your suffering, that would just change its form, because we believe in future lives, right? So ending suffering for us has nothing to do with death. Ending suffering means removing the causes of suffering. And the fact that our body hurts and our mind hurts are because they were born from karma and disturbing emotions. So if we can get rid of karma and disturbing emotions, the mind doesn't hurt and the body doesn't hurt. Or we can have a body and a mind that doesn't have those built in. So what we're looking at is even just that basic clarity of mind meditation that we did, the surface agitation has time to settle and you can access some of the potentiality of your mind without even having really worked on it. So say you touch that clarity of the mind, you can then go further than that and develop that clarity into an incredible wisdom, which then means you're not buying into the lie of our ignorance all the time and not creating negative habits on the back of that and not hurting ourselves and others on the back of that. And it's like you're training yourself out of harm and out of suffering. So it, it's just about mental training, yeah, getting out of suffering. And death certainly would not end suffering from a Buddhist perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it seems like it would if you only believe in one life. It's, it's, it could be just lights out, nothing, you know, or it could be some heaven or something. There's a lot of views and totally up for debate. But from our perspective, you just keep on going until you figure it out. <laughs> and <yeah. laughs> pros and cons to that. Um, one of the Zoomers is asking a question. Um, Susan, go ahead. Um, yes, I, I have. I was wondering. I, as I was envisioning the blue sky, the space, and the clouds are like thoughts, which we can get trapped in. Um, I I went just sort of, I went through a cloud and all I felt was slight moisture like on my face and it was a good feeling. And I'm wondering, and then came out on the other side into the clarity of the sky where there are no thoughts. And I was wondering, is that just a spacey um, visualization or is it, what is it? Yeah. Does it, does it mean something? Well, I mean, it sounds like you have really beautiful ability to go into imagery and visualization, which might mean that Tantra would suit you really well. Um, the, the moisture experience and the kind of no thought experience, it, it's hard to say exactly if that was going in the right direction or if it was vaguing out. 
um, you will know, but if you ask yourself, did it lose clarity? Like, did it feel like the fog was rolling in and you were sort of heavy, relaxed, calm, but kind of like almost sleep, you know, kind of like, you know, or did it feel bright and clear? And like, if someone said something to you, you would turn to them and say, yes, with bright, vivid clarity, not vague, what? <laughs> you know, like you just woke up. Yeah. So that's a good litmus test. If after the meditation, you feel calm and clear, but vivid, you know, so you could answer a question easily and not like feel like you're returning from the land of the dead, right? <laughs> after your meditation and like, what is there people, you know, then you've gone kind of into what's called laxity. Yeah. Which is basically like the edge of sleep and is comfortable, but is not what we're aiming for. Yeah, not what we're aiming for. I don't know. Did that help, Susan? Yes, it did. Thank you. Uh, it was clear. It was clear. I went it was clear. It was just a moment of, of that moisture on my face. So, no thoughts and then clarity. Yeah, no, it, in that case, it might have been going the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. So far, so good. <laughs> yeah. So far, so good. Thank you. Yeah, Catherine? And we have a uh, we have a typed question um, from Alex. Um, it's uh, does a spacious mind have less talking in it? My meditation seems to be filled with words and sentences with no break. It seems to be keeping me from focusing. Does a spacious mind? Do you guys hear that? Yeah. <laughs> so um, a spacious mind is there regardless of how chatty the surface is. So don't worry. You can be totally, you know, just like internal narrative, like going nonstop words after words after words, or, you know, you could have like static, <laughs> right? You could have random colors, shapes, sounds, in any number of things could be happening. And you just decide that is not your main interest. Your main interest is what else is there. So if you can kind of find, it's like, you know, the gaps in the clouds, you know, or like you're in an airplane and you go up above the clouds. But if you can touch that place where there is also clear, spacious stillness, that chatter can continue, but you're not worried about it and you're not identified with it. And that's not where you're living anymore. So don't worry if your brain or your mind or both are very noisy or very quiet. Don't worry about that. It's like, don't worry about the weather. The clear blue sky is always there. Yeah, so you don't have to turn down the volume of your thoughts or squash them. Please do not squash your thoughts. Do not chase your thoughts. Just let them do what they're going to do and decide that is not the point. The point is what else is there and see if you can connect with that. And what you'll find is that sometimes the chatter will then calm or slow, but not in a foggy way, just in a like <sighs> relaxed way. Yeah, yeah, one more and then we've got to take a break. Go ahead. Um, is, is it unusual to, to find that place of clarity and then um, I find myself wishing that I had a single point of focus, something to do with that clarity? Um, and I know we did go to that today, but, but I got to the point where I'm like, okay, now I want to use this mm. focus to address something, um, but then yeah, she's asking, what next? <laughs> clarity, what next? <laughs> what do I do with my clarity? Yeah, yeah. And what do you do with your clarity? You can't just be like, isn't it nice that I have clarity and then dedicate and move on with your life. That's mm -hmm. nice. What you can also do is take that and then bring insight to it. So if you have an understanding of reality, then you bring that to your observation of clarity and you go into what's called Mahamudra meditation or Dzogchen. And these higher meditations can be um, delved into. Other things you can do is once you've touched the clarity, you can invite analysis you know, on purpose intentionally and say, now I would like to invite compassion or kindness or you know something like love into that and it's got more space to take hold because it's not so noisy mm -hmm. and then it can just imbue that space so you can then consciously shift to analysis and it's got a good chance of really sinking in so that's another way yeah yeah so a lot of a lot of directions you can go from there but yay to even touch it so um so we're going to need to finish up the session um and uh Catherine has an announcement. Oh, Venerable Ingrid, yes, sorry. Yeah. 
Yesterday, one of the participants asked me uh, a, que a question that I said you will be able to answer. <laughs> it's why, let's say, three times around the table. Why 21 times recitation? Why the, does the mother have 108? <laughs> Um, venerable is um, handballing a question to me about the numbers. Yeah. Yes, the numbers in Buddhism, like why three times, why seven times, why 21 times? And um, what my own teacher said about the three times is very, very mundane and adorable. It's emphasis. So it's like, get ready, get set, go. <laughs> yeah, and that if you do it in this way, you're more likely to actually connect. So say you're saying the refuge in Bodhicitta prayer, the first time you're just like, oh yeah, I'm doing this. The second time you're like, oh yes, I believe this. The third time it's like sinking in and you're actually in it. You know, so it's really those three times, my, my guess she said it's just emphasis. And then, you know, 7, 21, 108, that these are on one perspective, sacred numbers with all sorts of interesting scientific things about them. Somewhat, they, some people say that they're somewhat arbitrary and that it's just keep going, keep going, repetition helps, but it helps us have like a finite goal to organize the mind. So there's those two views. There's the, you know, kind of sacred geometry, sacred math sort of reasons, and then also just practical considerations of the more repetition, the deeper it goes. So this is what I've heard. It's probably unsatisfactory answer. No, it's, that's all I got. <laughs> um, so then some um, announcements and then we'll call it. Yes, thank you so much, Venerable. This has felt like a really, rich session. I can't believe that we covered so much ground in one hour. Um, and on the topic of um, repetition, there is an opportunity to repeat meditation um, with Venerable starting at 2 p.m. Pacific time this afternoon. So I imagine some of the Zoomers will be joining again. So we'll look forward to seeing you then online. Um, and again, it's the hybrid format. So those of you who are present in person are also welcome to rejoin so long as the Gompa doesn't max out in terms of number of people in the space. Um, and just another super quick announcement. There are more opportunities to study with Venerable. Um, she mentioned the um, body cheetah motivation. So on Wednesday nights, um, Venerable through to December um, is teaching again this hybrid format so you can join on Zoom or in person with those limitations um, 7 p.m. through to 8.30 p.m. Wednesday nights Pacific time through till um, early December um, and to register for that uh, just a super quick clue on how to navigate our website until we have a more friendly website go to our homepage landofmedicinebuddha.org top left hand corner says Dharma programs go on to that and the calendar is the second option. There you can see everything in glorious clarity. Thank you okay, so much. Thank you so much everybody and we'll reconvene at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Yeah, and uh, Zoomers, it'll be different meditations. So if you were looking for different ones, we're gonna do some different ones. It won't be just a repeat. So see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>